G'day YouTube, DT here. Uh, so maybe a fairly generic sort of video, but I figured I'd make one about uh, quite simply five good things and five uh, not so good things that uh, I've seen in China over the past year and a bit. First good thing is I would say um, quite excellent infrastructure that you have here. Um, I mean Shenzhen, again, it's a city, it's got 12 million or 20 million, I'm not sure the exact number, there seem to be different figures. Um, but it's got millions and millions of people today, it's this great big mega city. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, of course, it was a fishing village, so it's almost all entirely new. You have these new skyscrapers popping up. Um, the metro system is excellent. Uh, I've been to a few big cities, and I think it's very, pretty much the best I've ever seen, um, except maybe Berlin. Berlin's is also very good. One downside is that it doesn't actually run all night. Uh, it starts about 6 in the morning, goes till around 11 or midnight. Um, you know, back in Melbourne, at least on Friday and Saturday nights now, you do have all-night trains, uh, even if they only run every hour or so, but um, in Shenzhen it does mean that if you are staying out till maybe 3 in the morning and you don't want to wait till 6 in the morning to take the metro again, then you are probably going to get a taxi back uh, or a Didi, which isn't so bad because there's typically quite a few around and they're not that expensive, um, but you know, you might be fine that you'll have to wait half an hour or so if you have trouble getting a taxi or the Didis are very busy and then it might set you back, I don't know, 100 yuan or so. Uh, when I traveled between cities, when I did a big China tour last August, uh, you know, I was on a uh, high-speed train doing 300 kilometers an hour, which I hadn't done before. Again, Germany, I did, there was one train that did 250, um, but 300 kilometers an hour, it's pretty much the fastest you'll find in the world, trains like that. And as well as that, you've got, you know, the tallest building in Shenzhen is the Ping'an International Finance Center. I have been at the top of that. I did uh, have a look last year, and that's 600 meters tall which makes it the fourth tallest building in the entire world. It's number four. So you have the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, you have the Shanghai Tower, there's one tower in Saudi Arabia, and then you have this one. So really quite incredible. Um, basically, yeah, if you like 600 meter tall skyscrapers and you like 300 kilometer an hour high speed trains, China is the place for you. Second thing that I quite like about it, um, there's quite an infusion of Western culture and brands here. Uh, I mean, you know, some people might say that whether that's a, argue whether that's a good or a bad thing, um, but, you know, if you want to go and get McDonald's, if you want to get KFC or Starbucks, there's plenty of them around. You might as well be in New York or, or London or, or Melbourne or somewhere. Um, you know, the McDonald's is particularly good because you can just order. There's the, um, with the electronic menu. Uh, KFC, not quite as good. I didn't get KFC as often while I was here because you had to get an actual physical menu and try and explain to them what you want. But with McDonald's, you just go up, press the right buttons. Uh, you can set it in English or Chinese. You can just pay with WeChat. It's very simple. And, you know, young kids here in particular do know of quite a lot of Western culture. Um, you know, if you're at a training center and you have the 10 minute break in the middle, the Chinese teacher will put on a cartoon and usually it's something like Tom and Jerry or it might be Peppa Pig. Um, and the adults, of course, know quite a bit as well. You know, you can talk to them and they'll say like, oh yeah, yeah, looking forward to the new season of Game of Thrones. Um, they're quite aware of Western culture here. Um, one thing I did notice also is you have quite a lot of Australian products, like agricultural products at the supermarket, especially if it's a, if it's a high-end sort of supermarket. Um, but, you know, I've sort of wondered all these years, we are importing all this stuff, pretty much everything in China, all sorts of physical manufactured goods. It does say made in China on it. And so you kind of got to wonder what we're sending back the other way because it must be something. And it turns out, yeah, um, you go to a good supermarket in China, you'll see Australian beef, Australian oranges, Australian oysters, uh, Australian salt for some reason. Not quite sure how it's different to regular salt, but there you go. Good Australian salt. Map of Australia. Kangaroo. Definitely it's Aussie. Admittedly, if you do want the good Aussie milk like this, uh, for starters, it's long life milk, but otherwise pretty much the same. Uh, although it is more expensive here, I recall in Australia, uh, cost per litre of milk, about $1. Here in China, for Australian milk, you'll pay around 12 or 15 yuan per litre, uh, and the ratio is about 5 yuan per Aussie dollar. So, yeah, $2.50 or $3 for a litre of milk. Um, and I do buy it, I buy just a few liters a week because again, I, I really love my milk. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm, you know, I'm still a 12 year old boy at heart and I do love my Nesquik, which you can also buy here, but again, for outrageous prices, that's 75 yuan for about half a kilogram. So $15 for half a kilogram of Nesquik. Um, can't quite remember what it was in Australia, but I'm sure it was a lot cheaper than that. Uh, again, so these are more expensive here, uh, but having said that, you know, it is just a bit of milk or something. Um, it's only a very small part of the food budget and that's only a small part of your overall budget. So it's just a luxury, a few dollars extra a week that I do spend so that I can have my, you know, good cup of chocolate milk. I just want milk that tastes like real milk. 
Third good thing, uh, there is quite an abundance of English teaching jobs here, you know. I mean, if you didn't like your job, you can quit, and within two weeks, pretty much guaranteed, you'll find something else, provided you have your visa situation sorted out. I found that foreigners are treated very well. Uh, I've never really felt threatened in China. I never felt like people, like I wasn't welcome. Uh, look, to be honest, I've barely ever witnessed any violence in China. I mean, I've been here about 14 months now. Uh, you know, even in a city like Melbourne, after 14 months, you'd probably expect to see a few punch-ons at a bar or something. Um, and 14 months, I think I've seen maybe two or three instances of violence. And every time, it's been foreigners. It's always been, it's been at the local McDonald's uh, at three in the morning on a Saturday morning. Uh, and they're having a bit of a punch on. Never, I never see Chinese do it. As far as I can tell, the Chinese are entirely non-violent, um, and there are lots of police everywhere. There's sort of, like, I think they're police. There might be the sort of local security guards or something, but, you know, the sort of little urban village that I'm in, there's, like, three or four little gates around the entrances, and there's just a guy in a black uniform, the police officer, is just kind of sitting there, three in the morning on a cold night, and he'll still be sitting there, and there's just security cameras everywhere. Like, I'm not saying there's no crime here, um... I mean, like, before I came to China, I was sort of told, you know, beware of pickpockets and everything. Like, I had my passport and a little belt around my waist to, so it was secure. Um, but I pretty quickly gave up on that because I've just, I never encountered anything, even sort of scam-wise. Like, they said, you know, beware of the, the tea house scam. Like, someone invites you for tea at their restaurant and then they, you know, you have a pleasant conversation with them and then they hand you the bill and it's like for 500 yuan or something. Never really had anything like that, although I guess I've just been fairly cautious. Um... Yeah, I've never really felt threatened in China. Um, on the whole, a very safe place. I'd say at least as safe as somewhere like in the West, like in Australia or in, or in Europe, and probably actually quite a bit safer than a lot of American cities. So I wouldn't say that's a problem here. And one thing I will mention, um, look, you know, I could do a lot longer videos on this, and you can find a lot of stuff online, but, um, you know, Tinder actually works here. Um, it can Tinder, or there's Chinese equivalents like Tantan. You know, you put your account in, set your location here, and, you know, just the fact that you're sort of a... Westerner, it helps, I guess, if you're kind of tall and Western and, and have, I guess, light skin. Uh, you know, these are all things. The beard as well, um, you know, that, that a lot of uh, Chinese people take to them quite favorably. I did have one Chinese girl here, actually, who gave me a nickname. She started calling me uh, Mei Gord uh, and it turns out it means, like, Captain America. Fourth great thing, uh, there is a lot of interesting stuff to see in China. I mean, it's not true, uh, it's, it's not false, I should say. When they talk about 5,000 years of history, although I think the exact year is, it's, you know, kind of disputed. I mean, is it 3,000 or is it 5,000? It depends on what you mean by history. Um, but China does have a history stretching back pretty much as far as Europe does. Uh, you've had the rise and fall of dynasties for centuries. Uh, and again, look, Shenzhen, in terms of touristy sites, like, there aren't really any old sites you can see. Because, again, the city wasn't here 40 years ago. It's just new sorts of things. So you have Sea World, which is sort of this entertainment district just down the road from here. Um, admittedly, it's not like a Western sea world. There aren't literally dolphins and animals you can go see. It's just a sort of restaurant entertainment district, but there's bars and nightclubs and everything, and it's quite good. If you travel a bit further afield, though, I mean, even Guangzhou, just up the road, uh, lots of interesting old things, old temples to look at. There's the Canton Tower, which, again, is one of the tallest structures in the world. It's over 600 meters. Uh, admittedly, there can be a few odd things, like I went to a temple in Guangzhou, and there were swastikas everywhere, because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's been this symbol of... Uh, I think Buddhism for the past 2,000 years until the Nazis sort of commandeered it. But, you know, you'll see a swastika there in a temple. You'll see two guys walk past you carrying a bit of fencing with a swastika on it. And it's just all so casual. No one says anything. And you're kind of looking at it like, Phew, you know, <laughs> you get a bit of a different reaction in the West. Um, but again, you know, you go to Beijing and the Forbidden City, uh, the Great Wall, of course. Um, Xi'an has its city walls, which I think actually is, is worth a look just to see these massive this massive thing. It really does look like something out of Game of Thrones, you know? You can sort of imagine you're in, like, the Chinese equivalent of King's Landing. Um, Lhasa. Lhasa was very interesting, actually, when I went to Tibet. Um, to describe Lhasa, I'd just say that Lhasa kind of felt more like China than China does. I mean, it's still like the old-fashioned China, you know? Lhasa's still a... It's like a city of maybe a few hundred thousand people, so it's still fairly small. It's not like the massive 20 million people mega city like Beijing or Shanghai or Shenzhen. It's still this moderately-sized city, and, you know, there's no metro system, there's no skyscrapers, it's still sort of old-school China. There's red flags everywhere. Um, you've got the Patala Palace, which is, this, again, this big fortress, you know, was originally the, um, uh, you know, the, the headquarters of the Dalai Lama of Tibet back when it was an independent state. Um, so, again, very interesting to visit. It feels just like something, like you're visiting somewhere in Westeros. Um, 
or Lord of the Rings or something, you know, just to put a sort of Western modern pop culture view on it. Um, but there really are some amazing places to visit. And so I would say while you're here, go and do that. You'll have, you know, if you're working in China, you'll typically have some holidays around Chinese New Year for maybe three weeks. And then in summer around late June and August for perhaps six weeks. And I'd say take full use of it. You know, um, when I was here, the first big six week holiday period I had, I did a big China tour. Again, went to Chongqing, Lhasa, Mount Everest, Xi'an, Beijing. Thought about going to Shanghai, but I sort of had enough by that point. So I came back to Shenzhen. Uh, might go to Shanghai some other time. And I just had the Chinese New Year holidays uh, back in February just recently. And I went to the Philippines there. It was also quite fun. But there is a lot to look at in China. You could spend years exploring China and you'd still barely scratch the surface. Fifth good thing I'd say, uh, you know, this one's pretty broad. But, you know, there are certain things that are more permissible here than in the West. Obviously, the things where it's the opposite. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be caught smoking marijuana in China because the consequences could actually be quite severe. Um, but things like um, the availability of alcohol, that's just everywhere. Uh, I mean, it depends where you are in the West, because, um, you know, the US and I think Australia are a bit more restrictive. Europe might be a bit more liberal with it. Um, but in Australia, you know, alcohol is something that can only be sold at specific liquor, specific liquor shops. So you can't just, you can't even walk into Woolworths and buy it. There's a little separate section, you know, Woolworths liquor you've got to go into and you've got to show your ID and everything and be over 18 to buy it. Um, whereas in China, it's just... You know, any you know, any there's alcohol everywhere. Every little corner shop in China, every little Seven Eleven or whatever their equivalent is, there's a fridge full of beer and spirits and everything. Um, you know, where my apartment is now, there's got to be half a dozen of those shops within a two-minute walk of here. So it's just very convenient. Uh, and you know, if you had some, a ten-year-old in China, they can go and buy alcohol. They'll just say it's for their uncle or whatever. That's fine. They don't care. Anyone can buy alcohol. Uh, or things like you know, if you want to hop on a scooter and ride around, like you want to as in, you know, someone to give you a lift if you can't find a taxi or whatever. Again, uh, I don't think they really follow helmet laws here or anything. I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but certain things, again, it's like this sort of, in the West, some might say we've got a bit of over-regulation going on. There are just way too many things that are banned or there's so many restrictions. Uh, in China, that's sometimes the case, but sometimes it just isn't. Sometimes they just don't care, you know. They're a country that's still a bit less developed, and so certain things just more permissible in China, and it is good to have that freedom in some areas.